We're going to take a couple of weeks to talk about Samson. We're not going to try to do all of his history in one. He starts in chapter 13 and goes all the way over through the end of 16. So, I mean, there, there's a lot of information on Samson. More people know stuff about Samson than maybe some of the other ones, and we're going to do a little bit of contrast as far as that's concerned. One of the things in particular that people remember about Samson is a little bit like David when you say David and, people say Bathsheba, right? And if you say Samson and Delilah. So, you know, people remember the mistakes that he made a little bit more than the, the good things that he did. And to tell you the truth, Samson is, is not renowned for doing like great moral things. He did things to help God uh, fight back against the enemy, against the Philistines in particularly. But uh, not, again, not the kind of guy that was in polite company very often. I want us to start tonight, though, by going back to Judges 10. Judges 10. We're going to look at verses 3 through 5. The question was raised... Uh, why do we need to know about all those donkeys? What's the purpose of giving us all that information about all those donkeys? So I watched a few videos and did a little bit of reading, and I think the best answer that I came up with was there's a comparison kind of subtly underneath the, the surface with whether a leader was more interested in doing something on behalf of the Lord or whether the leader was more interested in doing something on behalf of themselves. So when, you, when the only stats that you get are physical statistics, you don't see any visitation where God came and said, hey, I need you to save the people. You don't have any visions. You don't have any dreams. You don't have any signs and wonders pushing this person to do anything. It's just physical things. So when you look at Jair, and it says, uh, Jair of Gilead led Israel 22 years. He had 30 sons who rode 30 donkeys. They controlled 30 towns in Gilead, which to this day are called Havath Jair, which uh, is to say the land or the area of Jair. What do we know about the guy? Physical stuff. Uh, we don't, there's nothing to commend him to us as far as whether he was a godly man or not. His leadership is not typified by godliness, but not necessarily by ungodliness. Look at verse 6. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and they served the Baals and the Ashtoreths. So it seems that maybe while he was doing whatever he was doing, while he was in leadership, that we didn't have that wandering off after the Baals and Ashtoreths. Uh, but again, it doesn't say anything about what hand he might have played in keeping people uh, faithful to the Lord. Uh, he seems to have been a lifelong leader. He was maybe a professional politician. He had 30 sons. Uh, does that tell you anything about his marital status? We hope that he had more than one. Right, not not for moral reasons, but just we don't want one wife to have to have thirty kids. I don't know what the world record is. I should have looked that up. It's it's probably a bunch, but thirty sons probably means that he had more than one wife. And again, we don't have any indication of who people were worshiping during his time frame. Just that after he was gone, they were worshiping the Baals and the Ashtoreths again. All right, now go over to chapter twelve. And verse 8, we get three more of the judges that are given to us the same way that uh, they were given in Judges 10. Right? So you get three judges, which are very quick, back to back, and then you get a longer rendition of another judge. So we get Ibzon, Elon, and Abdon all together. Uh, we won't read all of them. Ibzon basically had 30 sons and 30 daughters. So he's got 60 kids. 
If he didn't have multiple wives, I don't know how else to explain it. So we don't know how many wives he had, but let's say every wife had five, right? And he's got 60, right? Can you do the math? That's about 12 wives, right? So there's, there's a sense that having a lot of wives gives you prestige, and then he intermarried with the neighbors outside of his clan. Now, whether the people were members of Israel or whether they were people that were outside of Israel, it doesn't say in the text, but he married off his daughters to the folks outside of his clan and married, you know, got women for his sons and brought them in to be part of his clan. Again, no mention of the Lord at all. Ibzan was a rich guy with a lot of kids, and he did a lot of intermarrying, probably for political reasons. So again, probably a professional politician. Uh, Abdon, he set some records. He had 40 sons. We're not told how many daughters he might have had. And he had 30 grandsons. And again, no indication of how many granddaughters. So he's he's got 40 sons. So again, if we give him five each, he's got eight wives perhaps. Uh, and these guys all drove the, the latest model year of the donkeys, right? So you've got 70 donkeys. So he's ahead of our, our 30 donkeys. He's got 70 donkeys. And again, one of the guys that I was watching that was commenting on this said, if that's your claim to fame, that you were rich enough that all of your sons and your grandsons all had their own donkey. If that's what you're remembered for, okay. But it's not a statement about your spiritual standing. It's a statement about your physical standing. And I thought that was probably a good answer to the question, why did we need to know about the donkeys? Uh, it may, be, may have more to say in a quiet way about where their emphasis was directed during their lives. Okay? And again... You get to the end of chapter 12, and you've seen Ibsan, Elon, and Abdon. I'm sorry, the end of 13. Is that right? No, the end of 12. Uh, Abdon. Uh, and you don't get much about him. He had 40 sons, 30 grandsons. They rode the 70 donkeys, led Israel for eight years. Then Abdon of Hillel died and was buried in the hill country of the Amalekites. Okay, so he's intermingling maybe with Amalekites. But then notice the next verse. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So it's that same thing. We had three guys who didn't do much. We don't know much about what they accomplished. The next verse is Israel did evil in the eyes of the Lord. We get it repeated again at the end of 12 before we end up meeting Samson. Right? Now we're going to spend some time in chapter 13 because Samson's arrival is amazing in and of itself. And then we'll talk about his career, uh, Lord willing, next week. But let's just start by reading the first couple of verses of uh, chapter 13, and you'll immediately get a sense of where this is headed. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. A certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites, had a wife who was childless, unable to give birth. What's going to happen? She's going to have a child, and it's going to be a very important child, right? Every time. So when we're given that information, we already know kind of what's about to unfold for us. The way that it unfolds is really interesting. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are barren and childless, but you're going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink, that you do not eat anything unclean. You will become pregnant and have a son uh, whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite, dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. I find a lot of similarities between this passage and the passage in which Zechariah is told that Elizabeth is going to have a son. Right? Zechariah, who was of the, the uh, division of Abijah, of the Levites, and his wife Elizabeth, had never been able to have kids. 
And so we're immediately going, okay, you told us that, something's about to happen. The angel appears to him at the temple and tells him, your wife is going to be pregnant, she's going to have a son. John the Baptist is actually another Nazarite. So we have two times that an angel shows up and declares to the parents, you're going to have a child and he's going to be a Nazarite. In this one in particular, there is a very specific set of rules and regulations that go along with her being pregnant with a Nazarite, right? Not just when he grows up, he'll choose to take a Nazarite vow and he'll be a Nazarite once he gets older. He's going to be a Nazarite, period. From the time he's conceived, consider him to be a Nazarite. This is the only one of the judges that is not an adult when he gets chosen. Right? All the rest of them, we've got the problem and God calls somebody who's already grown up, who's already a warrior, already ready to, to do whatever God needs him to do. In this one, we have an unborn child, not even she's not even pregnant with him yet, and God says, I'm calling him to be my guy. So from conception, he's going to be a Nazarite, and he's going to be called to be God's man to deal with the Philistines. Right? So there are three things, only two of them are mentioned here, that Nazarites had to avoid. Number one was grapes, and not just wine, but grapes, period. No grape juice, you know, uh, better watch out for that high C grape drink. Just don't, if it's grape, don't drink it. Uh, he was not allowed to have anything that came from the vineyard. The biggest problem is in the drinking of alcoholic grapes. But the rule is nothing from the grape. The second rule is the don't uh, ever cut his hair. So when you've got little kids and they're growing up and, you know, it's cute for a little while and then it's just wild and you're ready to give it a snipping, uh, my grandmother, if she caught us with our hair growing too long, would take uh, scotch tape. Do you, anybody ever do that to you? Robert's laughing at me, but it, it's, it's true. Uh, Johnny Mama would put scotch tape across here to hold it down and then get her scissors and give you the absolute worst bang line known to mankind. Uh, it, it may have been worse than a bowl cut, but Samson was safe. His mommy and daddy were not going to give him any kind of haircut. And this one mentions unclean food. Don't let him eat anything that's unclean. So uh, go back to the book of uh, Exodus, Deuteronomy, and look at the law, things that were clean and unclean. Uh, they knew those to some degree, but they didn't have a copy, right? These, these were not people probably that read and write, uh, could read and write. I, I think they were probably, most of Israel at this point was probably illiterate, at least to a large degree. So they, they didn't have a Bible that they could flip over there and, and look through these things. And Manoah is a guy who wants to get it right, right. So let's keep reading and see how he responds to the message that this angel has given to his wife. Who, by the way, I, I went back and double checked and I'm not, I don't think the wife ever gets a name. I think she's just Manoah's wife. Somebody help me with that if, if you spot it. Uh, I read back through it and, and didn't see it, but... Uh, so look at verse 6. The woman went to her husband and told him, A man of God came to me. He looked like an angel of God. The NIV says, Very awesome. He was very awesome. I didn't ask him where he came from, and he didn't tell me his name. But he said to me, You will become pregnant and have a son. Now then, drink no wine or other fermented drink, and do not eat anything unclean, because the boy will be a Nazarite of God from the womb until the day of his death. Manoah prayed to the Lord, pardon your servant. I beg you to let the man of God you sent to us come again to teach us how to bring up the boy who is to be born. Is that the right question? That's a whole other set of sermons right there. If you know that you're going to have a child, what's job one? Start praying about it, right? Probably have been praying about it before you ever got pregnant. But 
you're expecting a child, so you're praying, God, help me to get this right. When the child comes to you, you want to know the right things to do and the wrong things you know, not to do. You're, you're invested in making sure this kid is raised to be what God wants this kid to be. If you've had an angel show up and prophesy that you're going to have a child and tell you that the child's going to be a Nazarite, there's even a bigger burden. And Manoah says, God, I don't know that I've got this straight. I don't know if I can do this right. Send the angel back. Send your messenger back so that I can learn what I need to know. So God heard Manoah, and the angel of God came again to the woman while she was out in the field, but her husband Manoah was not with her. The woman hurried to tell her husband, he's here, the man who appeared to me the other day. So Manoah got up and followed his wife. When he came to the man, he said, are you the man who talked to my wife? And he said, I am. So Manoah asked him, when your words are fulfilled, what's to be the rule that governs the boy's life and works? The angel of the Lord uh, answered, your wife must do all that I have told her. She must not eat anything that comes from the grapevine, nor drink any wine or other fermented drink, nor eat anything unclean. She must do everything I have commanded her. So his answer to Manoah is, I've given your wife all the instructions that she needs. She's going to be responsible. She's the mother. It's her responsibility to make sure that this child is raised according to the rules that I've given to her. So Manoah said to the angel, we would like for you to stay while we prepare a young goat for you. Does that sound familiar? Angels show up, you cook for them. That's, that's you know, Abraham did it. Uh, who else cooked for the, uh, Gideon wanted to cook for the angels. Everybody wants to cook for the angels when they show up. It's, it's good hospitality. Uh, the angel of the Lord replied, even if you detain me, I'm not going to eat any of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, you can offer it to the Lord. Manoah did not realize that this was an angel of the Lord. Uh, evidently, Manoah thought that this guy was a prophet, that God had just sent the prophet to come tell them what they needed to know. He hadn't put two and two together yet to realize that this is actually an angel from God who has come with this special message to tell him uh, or to tell his wife the things that were about to happen. Uh, so Manoah inquired of the angel of the Lord, what is your name so that we may honor you when your word comes true? Well, that's a, another reasonable question. We would love to know your name so that when the child is born and people say, wow, it's wonderful you have a child. Well, yes. So-and-so told us this was going to happen, and it happened exactly like he said it would. He replied, why do you want to know my name? It is beyond understanding. Isn't that an answer? I can't tell you my name. It's beyond understanding. Let me remind you of a, a couple of times when we've run across things like this. When Jacob was wrestling with an angel or wrestling with God. It got toward the, the morning and the angel wanted to leave. Jacob wouldn't let him go. He said, I'm not going to let you go unless you give me a blessing. Remember that? And so the angel said, what's your name? He said, it's Jacob. He said, not anymore. Now your name will be called Israel because you have struggled with God and with man. And then Jacob says, what's your name? And he says, why do you want to know my name? And then he left. <laughs> he never told him his name. Angels don't like giving up their names, evidently. They don't want to share it. Uh, I had an, uh, an experience with a young Hispanic man several years ago, uh, and he had a, a last name that was about that long. And I wanted desperately as a substitute teacher to pronounce this young man's name correctly. And so got to his name, and I said, would you pronounce your name for me? I, I don't want to mispronounce it. And he said, your Anglo tongue can't handle it. <laughs> so this angel tells uh, Manoah, I'm sorry, I'm not going to tell you my name. It's, it's too wonderful for you. Uh, you don't have access to that information. So Manoah took a young goat together with a grain offering, sacrificed it on a rock to the Lord. And the Lord did an amazing thing while Manoah and his wife were watching. As the flame blazed up from the altar toward heaven, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. Seeing this, Manoah and his wife fell on their faces.
to the ground. That reminds me of Gideon. Gideon says, I'm going to bring you some food. And the angel says, put it down on the rock. And the angel touches it with, the, with his staff. And the whole, the whole thing bursts into flame. Well, here, uh, Manoah starts the fire. But then the angel ascends up in the fire and the smoke on his way back to the heavenlies. So angels are an amazing bunch. Uh, I'm not sure how badly I want to meet one now. Like I, I, I would love to, to have an experience where I actually saw an angel of God, but they're not to be trifled with. They're not simple. They're not us. And this particular angel was interested in making sure that Manoah understood his otherness, right? I won't eat your food. I won't tell you my name. And then he goes up in the flame and the smoke. So three different ways this angel kind of shows Manoah that there's a gap between the, the world in which Manoah is living and the experience that this angel is living. So Manoah finally realizes that it's an angel of the Lord. In verse 22 it says, we are doomed. <laughs> We're going to die. Uh, we have seen God. But his wife answered, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering from our hands, nor shown us all these things that uh, now he has told us about. Uh, the woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson. He grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him while he was in Mahana, Dan, between Zorah and Eshtaol. So the Spirit of the Lord is around. It's working in the life of Samson, even in his younger years, before we start seeing the real outpouring of the Spirit. This is the last time in Samson's life where the Spirit of the Lord is mentioned and he doesn't kill somebody. The rest of the time, it will say, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon Samson and, and the and is connected to a whole bunch of people getting dead. That is Samson's whole life story in his relationship to the Holy Spirit. Uh, he's about the only one in Scripture that that could be said of. His job was to kill Philistines. He was birthed, raised, indwelt by the Spirit for the purpose of delivering Israel from the Philistines. So of all the heroes in, in all of the judges, Samson is probably the most violent and the most successful in his work against the enemies of God. So we'll put a, a bookmark in at that right, right there and start with chapter 14 and look at his adult life uh, next Sunday. Anybody have any questions, thoughts on any of that? No? Okay. Yes, I, angels seem to have been very human-like in the way that they approached human beings, uh, probably to just keep from terrifying us. The times that angels show up that they're not in human form, typically the next thing that happens is people fall down on their face. They're just terrified. Uh, a couple of places an angel shows up and they faint. So, I mean... Angels are a, in a, in a sense, they're a higher level of being. Uh, don't know exactly how many eons they've been in the heavenlies, whether God created all of them at once or whether different ones have been created along the way. Don't know uh, all that much about angels. I do know that angels are seen as being superior physically to human beings. We have something on them, though. There has never been an act of redemption on behalf of the angels. The Hebrew writer writes about this in chapter 1, maybe, chapter 2. And he says that God didn't sacrifice his son for the angels. God sacrificed his son for human beings. So there's a... A, a love connection that the Father has for us as his creation. 
that's different from the connection that he has with the angelic beings. But they are an amazing race, an amazing group of individuals, and I think it'll be interesting when we get there that we'll be able to see them you know, and, and understand a little bit more about who they are and how they've worked uh, all throughout history doing what God wanted them to do in our world, whether we knew they were doing it or not. So, so it'll be interesting. Anything else? Yes, sir. How large is Gabriel? How big is Gabriel? I heard he was as tall as a two and a half story building. Is that true? Or not? Well, when Gabriel came to talk to, to a Daniel, giant. Right? Uh, when Gabriel came to talk to Mary, it doesn't talk about how big he was, just that he appeared to Mary. He's so the one that's come by the horn when the heathen world gets here, right? He's the one that has the horn. He he is the Gabriel seems to be more in charge of giving out information. He is uh, a very powerful angel, but he seems to be more involved in God sending messages to man through him. Uh, and then there's Michael, who is seen as a mighty warrior. You, you don't see him necessarily handing out information, but his job seems to be the captain of the armies overseeing Israel. So, I mean, he's a very, very powerful individual. But again, I, I know less about it than I might enjoy knowing someday. Anything else? Good questions. Okay. If there's something we can do to encourage you by way of a public response tonight, we'd love to do that while we sing.